This podcast is brought to you in part by Sing and Dog Double Read Supply. Sing and Dog Double Reads is an online double read shop and one of the largest suppliers of high quality and affordable professional and student reads for oboe and bassoon in the USA. Please visit www.singandog.com to see all of their products. That's S-I-N-G-I-N-D-O-G.com. The Southern Oboe Intensive provides a distinctive opportunity for oboists to spend five days immersed in world-class instruction. The Intensive draws students from middle school through college graduates from throughout the United States. During the Intensive, students at all levels are coached by James Sullivan of the Alabama Symphony, Russ DeLuna of the San Francisco Symphony, and Phil Ross of the St. Louis Symphony. Not only are these gentlemen exceptional oboists, but each brings extraordinary and unique experience and perspective to share with the participants. An additional one-of-a-kind benefit of the intensive is a recital performed by Mr. Sullivan, Mr. DeLuna, and Mr. Ross. Students will be instantly inspired by the level of artistry, collegialism, and joy evoked when these three superb musicians collaborate. Visit southernoboeintensive.com for more information and to register. That's southernoboeintensive.com. Hi, I'm Galit Kaunit. And I'm Jackie Wilson, and you're listening to Double Read Dish. A podcast for oboists, bassoonists, and the people who love them. So here we are for episode, man, I don't even know if I know what episode it is. I've lost count. It's 15. 15. Bassoon, okay. The bassoon episode, and the bassoon episodes are odd numbers because bassoonists are odd. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, the oboist <laughs> is the one saying this. Sure. Okay. Hi, Pot. Just nice. I'm Kettle. <laughs> Please don't go away, bassoon listenership. I'm just <laughs> Well, it feels like forever since I've seen you, but actually you were just in town. It was like last week. I know. It was so great. I guess we're calling that a rehearsal retreat? Is that is that our name for it? Well, we have a, a project that we're our read trio, Driftless Winds, is working on, but it's top secret right now, so we can't disclose but yeah rehearsal slash secret mission retreat (laughs) (laughs) yeah and um you guys were the sneakiest people on the planet that weekend because you threw me a surprise luau themed birthday party (laughs) you involved my wife in the planning and i had no idea i was so surprised I did. It was so much fun, although the listeners do not know, but you have ulcerative colitis. Correct. Which makes you, um, you know, have a lot of dietary restrictions. And I have never baked for someone with that amount of dietary restrictions. (laughs) I don't think I've even baked for anyone with dietary restrictions. And so I was sitting there like, oh, man. Is almond flour supposed to get this brown? Is it burning? (laughs) Is it brown? Is it okay? Oh, my gosh. All right. Coconut oil. What's (laughs) happening? And But it all turned out okay. Can you just tell the listeners how long you had to whip the frosting? (laughs) I whipped, okay, this frosting that we put on her cake. First of all, background, I can't have sugar. (laughs) Right. So we have to boil honey Uh with water until it gets to a certain temperature on the candy thermometer. And then I had to whip egg whites to a stiff peak, Mm -hmm. which I've never done before. And full disclosure, I have a stand mixer. I'm not doing it like Julia Child or anything. (laughs) But my stand mixer was going for 35 minutes. (laughs) That is a true friend. Like, that is the testament to true friendship is, like, the dedication to stiff peaks in icing. <laughs> Courtesy of my KitchenAid stand mixer. <laughs> <laughs> and to be clear, this is a, rep- a recipe that I beg my wife for on special occasions only because it's really annoying to make. <laughs> it wasn't so bad, and it was actually pretty good. I stood eating spoonfuls of it as I was icing your <laughs> cake. <laughs> 
Well, you guys are the best. That was like that was like the most fun I've had in a super long time. That was a really fun party. That was pretty fun. But back to double reads. I'm sure our listeners are like, we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> How are your summer projects going? Oh, they're going real good. Um, our secret project took up a lot of my time. So I'm just starting to get back into my recital project. Um, and I'm feeling a little bit stressed because I'm a little behind on that. But... I'm still really excited about it. So that's good motivation to practice. How about you? Mine are actually going pretty well. I go between feelings of intense stress and anxiety and feeling like I have all the time in the world. So, uh, yeah, my big project right now is learning the Barrio Sequenza and the circular breathing that goes along with that. And so far, it's actually going really well. The circular breathing came a lot faster than I thought it would. But now I've just got these huge, like, surges in both air and pitch at the moment of circular breath. So that's what I'm trying to kind of tone down. Right now it sounds like, oh, and it's, <laughs> yeah, it's not pretty. No that's, one wants to hear that's that. That's definitely but. also what happens when I circular breathe. <laughs> 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 I haven't quite figured out how to not do that. <laughs> so that's what I'll be doing for the rest of the summer. And I'm sure my husband, dog, and neighbors are delighted to hear my learning process. <laughs> so this time on shout outs we want to begin with an announcement that you know we're a little tired of bearing all the brunt of coming out with excellent recommendations for every single episode so uh, we want to delegate some of the work to you guys, our listeners. So we're um, having a standing open invitation for anyone who has something that they're excited about, a book, a recording, a resource, whatever it is. You know how we do our shout outs. Go ahead and um, into a recorder. You can even use the voice memo feature on your smartphone if you have one. Um, tell us who you are, um, where you're at, and what your shout-out is. Keep it no more than three and a half, four minutes, and you can send that to dish at gmail.com, and we would love to have some featured guest shout-outs. Yeah, and it would be really cool to get some crowdsourced resources and information from all of you guys because obviously we don't know everything and uh, that's the beauty of the internet is that we can um, all tap into different resources that we all have different access to. Yes, but for this time we are doing the hard work. So (laughs) what is your (laughs) shout out, Galit? Well, I am an overachiever, so I have two. Thank you very much. Um, The first one is a blog by Vicki Kwok. She's an oboist who lives in Hong Kong. It's called Forked F, and you can find it at ForkedF.com. And it is home to many awesome interviews. They are print interviews, so if you are, you know, needing a fix for some inspiration or information about um, oboe colleagues or, you know, life in the oboe world, you can read um, all of these great interviews by awesome oboists on her blog at forkdeaf.com. Yeah, I heard she had an especially cool oboist on her most recent post. Yeah, the uh, the guest for June was extra famous. <laughs> <laughs> give her some hits on her blog, would you? <laughs> the second shout out is, um, well, for my birthday, my wife, Becky, bought me a record player, which I know for the older listeners out there, you're all rolling your eyes because you all knew this already. But game changer for sound. I mean, I grew up with CDs and like, I'm listening to these records and it sounds like a live performance. It's like the closest you can get to a live performance because it's not compressed. So you actually get dynamics, which is so great. (laughs) (laughs) And layers of sound is just really great. And um, we got a record that is uh, 
done by the Vitamin String Quartet, but it's covers of Kanye West songs, and it is so good. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds really cool. And, you know, a lot of the really great older recordings uh, haven't been transferred, so it's kind of this new body of recordings you can listen to as well. Oh, yeah, and it sounds so good. I mean, it was just, we played, I think we played a Sanson recording, the first one we put on there, and we were both like, what? <laughs> this is so good. So if you have a chance, if you have access to a music library, you should go listen to some records. I'm absolutely positive that most music libraries have um, record players and um, records that you can just go listen to some stuff. And it's so good. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. What are your shout outs, Jackie? I only have one, but mine is super cool. It is the Crushing Classical podcast, which was hosted by Tracy Friedlander, um, who's a horn player. And it's this really cool uh, resource. Obviously, it's not double read specific. It's for any classical musician. And the goal is to really um, give new ways of thinking about how you approach your career um, and how to thrive and, and be inventive. And they're all about, um, you know, go for ideas and put yourself out there. And there's a lot of cool ways that they approach it. Um, and the podcast has several series. They have an interview series. Um, she just had Kara Lamore actually on the interview series. And I know Janet Engel is coming up as well. So there's some double read specific interviews that everybody can check out. Um, and then she's also got the fireside chats um, where she sits down and talks to her friend and this business minded person who used to be in classical music, but is now um, from what I understand a consultant. And um, her name is Eileen Gordon. And they just sit and talk. And I love that because even though I love our interview based podcast, um, as a listener, I really prefer um, listening to conversations and conversational podcasts and whatnot. So uh, Crushing Classical does a little bit of both, you know, whatever you like, it can offer you both. And then the last series is the hot seat. Well, they'll bring on someone who has um, a question or is maybe at an impasse in their career and they'll advise them and whatnot. And I really like it. You know, it's a very different vibe than ours. Um, they're not afraid to get real in terms of um, their personal experiences and, and those type of things. And, um, yeah, it's just a really earnest, honest podcast. Not that we're not honest, but you know what I mean? We, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they really make themselves vulnerable, I guess, in a personal way, which I like a lot. And, um, yes. I reached out to Tracy to ask if there's anything she wanted me to be sure to say, um, and she wanted to point listeners to Fireside Chat number 14, um, where they invite people to join into a 100-day challenge, um, and, and this can be in a lot of different ways, but basically focusing on doing something for 100 days straight and watching things transform. So, yeah, I know Double Read Dish was kind of a new medium. Not everyone who's interested in Double Read Dish is a podcaster. You know, we've had questions like, can I listen anytime? Or um, is it a radio station or whatnot? So if you're just kind of getting into the podcast medium, this is a, another show that might be relevant to you. And you can find it on iTunes and also at crushingclassical.com. That's so awesome. And it's women in podcasting, which we obviously love. Yes. So check out Crushing Classical. Genda Industries is making the reed knife great again with the Student Reed Knife by Genda. Genda Industries is known for its amazing quality and service in the double reed world. And in a world where the term student quality associates with cheap and disposable, Genda Industries is winning by making the best student reed knife ever. The student reed knife features a tapered handle that will fit any size hand as you grow, 
a high quality stainless steel blade that won't rust. It's actually sharpened and ready for use out of the box. It's designed to be used when learning how to sharpen and most importantly, since it is a Genda Read Knife, it is 100% supported by Genda. Plain and simple, the Student Read Knife by Genda is the knife you'll want to use as you start your read making and adjusting journey. Add the code DRDGENDA, all capital letters, no spaces, at checkout and get 10% off any Genda Read Knife maintenance kit, Read Knife Sharpening Book, Cutting Block, and Read Tool Roll. Visit them at GendaIndustries.com. Oh, and they're a lot more than just Read Knives. JDW Sheet Music is an online store that specializes in original chamber pieces for wind instruments. The website offers a variety of music transcriptions of composers like Debussy, Bach, Piazzolla, and Rachmaninoff. Owner and arranger Jessica Wilkins has produced over 60 chamber music arrangements featuring oboe and bassoon. Jessica's works have been performed at colleges across the country as well as the 2015 IDRS conference in Tokyo, Japan. For access to the entire JDW Sheet Music catalog, visit www.jdwsheetmusic.com. We are so pleased to welcome Frank Morelli to the podcast. Welcome, Frank. Um, we're so happy to have you on. Thank you. I really appreciate being invited. I, you know, I've seen the announcements of podcasts from you over time, and these, and I was, uh, you know, just happy to see what you're doing, and and hoping that you might ask me. So I'm glad to be here. <laughs> I'd love to start by asking you to introduce yourself to our listeners and telling us about your training and educational journey and how you got to where you are today. Oh, boy. How many hours do we have? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it as brief as I could. I can. Well, uh, Frank Morelli, I was born and raised on Massapequa, Long Island, which is on the south shore of Long Island, about an hour commute from New York City. And um, the reason I got into music, my first uh, experience with music was through the public school system. Uh, in the fourth grade, it was time to choose an instrument. My parents very much wanted and expected their two sons, I being the younger of two, to be involved in what school had to offer. You know, our job was to do well, and part of that, of course, was music. And so I actually wanted to be a saxophone player first. And believe it or not, I'm, I'm now, I think most people that know me know I'm a pretty big guy at about 6'3". And when I was fourth grade, I wasn't quite big enough for the saxophone. So I started on a metal clarinet, which is now a lamp in my studio, that my father had, and all of the aluminum clarinet. My dad was not a musician at all, but at one point he decided he was going to try to play the clarinet. And um, the slightly warped metal clarinet, one-piece clarinet, and uh, that was my first instrument. And then, then I became a sax player, and then when I was going into high school, our band director, uh, actually it was the junior high band director, but he said, you know, Frank, they really could use a bassoon player. Are you interested and trying out the bassoon. And so I thought, oh, what the heck, I'd give it a try. And that's how I started playing the bassoon. I don't come from a musical family. I often say, you know, classical music in our house was Sinatra. And whatever was on the Ed Sullivan show, if it was Beverly <laughs> Sills or Jan Pierce, or, you know, in terms of culture, Nureyev and Fontaine doing a pas de deux, that was basically my ex exposure to uh, culture in that regard, that kind of culture, and and the music ed system, and um, my to, a funny story. My very first lesson was going to be in the summer before the ninth grade. We had a, a summer music, you know, back in the day when music education was really part of the system. In my town, the Massapequa, which had two high schools, we had uh, each high school had at least one orchestra, several choruses two bands, dance band, all of that was going on. And we had a summer music program, including, including a summer community band. And but um, So I went, I bicycled clear across town for my first lesson, 
with, who would be my high school band director. I was quite nervous. And he had a, an old Kohler bassoon from the closet. And I showed up and uh, put the bassoon together. And he said to me, okay, let me have the reed. And I asked him, the reed? He said, your, <laughs> your junior high band director didn't say you had to go and buy a reed? I said, no, he didn't. So that was my first lesson. That I, learned. <laughs> I learned that, in fact, you need a reed to play the uh, bassoon. So uh, I went home quite despondent that I actually hadn't started playing the bassoon. And then my mom took me to the music store nearby and I bought a Misan reed in a plastic little plastic box. And I brought that the next time, the next week probably. And then I remember bringing the bassoon home after my teacher gave me a Rubank book out of his library of stuff, you know, music ed library, and this old colored bassoon, and this still rings in my ears. I put it on a kitchen table, and I put it together, and I played a few notes, and my mother said, asked me, Frankie, is it supposed to sound like that? <laughs> and, and I say, I probably to this day every now and then think, I wonder, <laughs> are you supposed to sound like that? So, so I come, I come from eager beginnings as a classical musician and um then to make a lot you really to fast forward now as quickly as possible uh that as uh, you know in high school during my day it was the day of the moonshot and all that i was in school in the 60s and you know by the time i got to middle school and high school junior high as we called it in high school <clears throat> and everybody was becoming engineers you know on long island we had grumman which who built the lem the lunar excursion module and so i thought i was going to go into math or science because i was pretty good in them not great, but good enough. Um, but I got started to get bitten by the music bug, and so I had I decided that I would become a music teacher. My role model was my band director, who was a, quite an excellent trombonist, and had played in Navy bands during World War II. You know, because I come from that era after the war. And uh, my other first role model was. Our mailman, who Angelo Amari, who was also a saxophone player and played weddings and stuff. So my first image of a career in music and what I set out to do was to be a band director, to play sax like on gigs, you know, and maybe bassoon in a community orchestra like we had in Massapequa. We had a, a semi-pro community orchestra, which still exists in a different form. And I'd only made it the second bassoon in the Massapequa Symphony. That's one of my disappointments. But anyway, I, you know, I've learned to overcome that disappointment. And um, <laughs> so off I went to Fredonia State University, upstate New York, to be a music teacher. And in my first year there, I, I kind of felt like I needed to become a better bassoon player. Um, I felt that the you know, there was a lot of distraction with the music ed part and that students weren't that serious. Although I had a very nice teacher named Jack Gillet who was just then starting out his career. And if you would have told me that my student would replace him when he retired, you know, I never would have believed it. But that's exactly what happened. And the wonderful Laura Kepke is the bassoon professor at Fredonia today. Uh, to make a long story short, I... I transferred in my first year, at the end of my first year, to the Manhattan School of Music, which had a master's degree in music ed or an affiliation with Columbia, which I think they have again now. And my thought was I would finish my undergraduate degree as a music, as a bassoon major, so that I could become the best player and musician I could be, and then I would get a degree in music ed. And once, once I met up with Stephen Maxim, my teacher, he it changed the course of my life. And pretty soon after that, it was clear I probably wasn't going to end up teaching in the high school, as much as I'm sure I would have enjoyed that life. Uh, and uh, one thing led to another, and these incredible things happened to me, <laughs> you know, as a player and teacher. But that's how I got there through the back door, you might say. Um, because he is such a legend, of course I want to get into you and your illustrious career, um, but I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what lessons with Mr. Maxim were like and 
um, kind of expand on the the impact that he had as your mentor. I did my undergrad with a Maxim student, and so I went through four years seeing his pictures on the walls and, and hearing about how wonderful he was. So I'd love to hear your perspective. Well, um, he was a very caring teacher, but also uh, he was demanding, but not in the way of setting uh, big assignments of, you know, a mildy every week or something like that. He, uh, he I, I, like, I think I teach the same way, but he taught to the student where the student was. He, 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 he felt what he was there to do, and I feel the same, was to help each student reach his or her potential on their road. He expected students to think for themselves. He was not content for you to just do the assignment and show up. He wanted you to think for yourself as well, to really form an opinion of a piece of music, even an Emilde Etude, concert etude, before you played it for him. Uh, he was, uh, of course, played at the Metropolitan Opera, so his, his uh, focus, his thinking was very much affected by the concept of singing, you know, from the mechanics of breath support, tone production, breathing, all of that, to how to turn a phrase. And so he was quite inspiring that way. And uh, in my own case, I mean, I have, I had, my both my parents have passed away, but I had wonderful parents, so it's not, I wouldn't be as melodramatic as to say, you know, like, he was the father I never had, because that isn't true. But he was my musical father. He still is. And a day doesn't go by that I don't think of him. And when I, in lessons, I'm always saying my teacher used to say, and you think he was in the next room. I mean, I kind of feel like he is in the next room. But you know what I mean, as if he was still here. And um, so he, we became very close. And... I studied with him for six years over a seven-year period because I took a year off and actually played in the Jerusalem Symphony in Israel. I I got a job there. I took an audition in New York on a lark and ended up with a job. Ended up in Israel. I took a year off and then came back before my doctorate. And, um, But towards the end of that time, I realized he used to talk a lot about the other students and tell me what they were doing and all of this. Sometimes I was thinking, let's uh, get on with the lesson, you know. But then I realized after a while, I think he had decided he was vesting me with his philosophy, you know, not just his teaching, his knowledge of the instrument and of music, but his philosophy. And I think he knew, well, I know he knew before I did, because it never would have occurred to me. I mean, I was a hot dog but I would never say I was so audacious as to think I would, I can't say take its place, but take over a position that he left like at the Juilliard School or Yale or Manhattan. And so I think he knew we thought a lot the same. We were kindred spirits in a lot of ways, he and I. Uh, But he had many students would tell you the same story of how he affected their lives. So it's not like I was the one special person that he affected this way. But somehow we developed this relationship, and I would say I was, but again, other students were too, I was very committed to the cause. You know, I didn't always work hard from one lesson to the next. I would have to say, I wasn't always a Boy Scout, but I, I took to heart everything he said. And I think he knew I was a very loyal and, dedicated, you know, you might say, disciple of his as, you know, in, as a teacher. And uh, he, I mean, to say that he changed the course of my life and I owe so much to him is not an overstatement. It's just a fact. And I know other of my dear colleagues, other of the Maxim family that feel the same way. So he was really amazing. And even when he came to the end of his life, he had come to New York we had sent him up to do some master classes. He was 87, I think. And I had been out there with Orpheus to, to California, and we had lunch. I went over to the house and had lunch. And he kind of dropped a hint that, you know, I'm 
kind of miffed you guys don't invite me in for master classes more often. And the thing is, you know, the way it works with master classes at the major schools, at least in New York, and I'm sure it's the same elsewhere, there isn't a great budget for this stuff. So we, you always hit upon your colleagues, like in New York, if, you know, Cleveland or Philly or someone comes to town, you try to get your colleagues in the section to be kind enough to come over and do a master class for not enough money. <laughs> you know, so here is Mr. Maxim retired and living in California, you know, and so and he wasn't coming east, you know, so we didn't ask him to do classes, but not because we didn't want him to, you know, so I set it up and well, along with others. But I came back with the message, like when I told Joe Polisi, who, of course, uh, knew Mr. Maxim as a teacher, you know, I mean, as a, as, I mean, one of his faculty at Juilliard, and, you know, Joe himself is a bassoonist, he immediately said, absolutely, let's make this happen. And Manhattan School felt the same way. And the reason I say this is then later, just a few months later, he was kind of tired when he was doing these classes, but, you know, a lot older, but was still the man doing his thing, and we were all there just, you know, talk about Kvelling, we were all sitting there, mm-hmm. us old students, watching him work with the young ones and remembering how wonderful and how lucky we were, you know, how wonderful it was. And then I wrote to him on email, said, you know, it's great, you know, like to know, would you like me to set up some concerts for the fall, concerts, some master classes, I mean, for the fall. And he writes me back this letter saying how this has been a great year. He had been inducted as an honorary member in the IDRS and to be recognized. He wrote sometimes in a flowery way and uh, to have come back and done master classes at Manhattan and Juilliard. Uh, so this has been a wonderful year, he says, but I must tell you that I've been diagnosed with uh, an illness that is, means that I don't have that long to live. But he starts this email about how great life is and how great everything is. Oh, by the way, I'm not going to be around that long. You know, like, oh, by the way. <laughs> that was him. No, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. so I'm reading this email and, and you know, and he remained absolutely positive to the to his last day. I went to visit him, and Lenny and Dell actually went on the same day. It was coincidental, but wonderful that we were there together. And uh, we went to visit him a week before he passed away. And fortunately, he wasn't in any sort of pain. He had a, I forget the exact name of the illness, but like a blood-type cancer disorder. It wasn't leukemia, but something that was going to finish him off in time. And so he was weakening, but not in pain, and he wasn't, he was very lucid, you know, but fortunately not suffering in the way of pain and, you know, that kind of thing. And we had this wonderful visit, and Mrs. Maxim even said, you know, it's everything I make for him is the most delicious thing I ever made. She says, he's so positive, and, you know, I'm just trying not to cry all the time. You know, you know, and I said to Lenny, you know, and Lenny said to me, whatever, we realized when we left that day, he said, you know, he taught us everything he taught us. And now he's teaching us how to meet the end of your days. So that's who you're talking about when you talk about Stephen Maxim. Before we get off the topic of Mr. Maxim, I and I'm not sure if this question has an answer, but I would love to ask it anyway. Um, can you describe your transition from seeing yourself as um, a music educator or band director in the public schools to seeing yourself as a top-level performer and teacher? Wow, you know, it just happened. The one thing I would give myself credit for, even though I didn't always work hard enough, I must be honest, (laughs) is I felt I needed to be the best I could be, you know? And sure, I also had a competitive feeling in me about, you know, how that would stack up against others. But I can honestly say, like I said, my motivation to leave Fredonia, which was a perfectly good place, was I felt I needed to be in a place where I could I could improve as an individual. You know, I needed to improve myself. As an, I realized how much I needed to learn. Well, I didn't realize how much, but I knew I need. Mr. Maxson knew how much, but I, <laughs> I, I need how much I needed to accomplish. You know that I needed to keep bettering myself. And I mean, I think that comes from somewhat of my background. I come from an really lower middle class, kind of blue-collar Italian-American family with hard-working parents, you know. And the idea was you work hard, you know. 
And uh, you better yourself. That was their dream. You know, my dad only made it through the ninth grade. He he left school, you know, in the in the thirties. You know, during the depression, and and then I, and went to work because that's what he had to do. So he wanted for his sons what he didn't have. You know, he wanted his sons to be educated and to improve the, the lot of his family. You know, which is the immigrant story anyway. My parents were both born in America, but all of my grandparents had immigrated from Italy. And they didn't have anything, I assure you, when they came here. They weren't doctors and lawyers. They were peasants. So um, I was just trying to improve myself. And opportunity came my way. And I never, like I said, I was a hot dog, and people that know me from back then would say, yeah, he's a hot dog. He was a hot dog. But uh, on the <laughs> instrument, you know, like to show off and, you know, work to play faster and louder, you know, all the stuff that bonehead teenage boys and, you know, early, you know, guys like me are into. But uh, the, the idea that I would have ended up doing what I'm doing, did uh, yeah, I can't say it ever occurred to me. I was just, you know, like my first image was I got to get a job in an orchestra. You know, I come from, you know, like you have to have a job. You have to have a steady job and you have to provide for your family. You know, that's what the man does. I know things have changed, you know, but that was how I was brought up. You know, I was going to be a dad, so a husband and a father, and so I have to get a job. And I ended up never, except for my one year in the Jerusalem Symphony, I've never held a full-time orchestra job. So there I thought I, I, the career I've had, even when I was pursuing a career, professional career, I never envisioned the career I ended up with. So the answer is I kind of I, I, I evolved. I evolved I, I, with, I think, by trying, you know, putting my chin out sometimes, you know, and landing on my face, running into brick walls, you know, turning around. Like, so maybe not a rat in a maze, maybe a little too demeaning for myself, <laughs> but, you know, heading down the next path, you know, when I hit a wall in, in, a, in one direction. And I was fortunate to be in New York, where personality and, and playing was an asset, and I became active in the New York scene. And... Uh, so it turned out I could actually pursue a career without having one job, you know, one employ major employer, like, say, the New York Philharmonic or the Met, and, you know, then teaching on the side at, you know, some of the local schools, obviously, like Juilliard in Manhattan when it comes to New York City, and, you know, playing other things, chamber music and things that my dear colleagues, you know, from the Met and Philharmonic, for instance, that I teach with, as they do, you know. But it didn't work out that way for me. But I found a way. Don't ask me how. And <laughs> the only way I can say how is by just trying, just going forward, putting one foot in front of the other. That's the best answer I can give you. One of our lovely listeners named Ritika has a question about what you look for um, in a student audition to one of the wonderful schools that you um, teach at, um, what do you look for in their playing during the audition process and um, even aside from their playing because you do get to hear some of the best um, audition candidates uh, in the country? Yeah, I'm fortunate, you know, uh, that being at the schools, I'm at some really great talent comes my way or our way. Uh, at both Juilliard and Manhattan, we have several uh, bassoon teachers. At Juilliard, we have four, and I think at Manhattan, we have four or five now, right? Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. So we have the same four from Juilliard, which is Judith LeClaire and Kim Laskowski from the Philharmonic, and uh, Billy Short, who I know you've interviewed, and myself. Billy from the Met and myself from uh, Orpheus, we're going to say from the outside world. And at uh, Manhattan <laughs> School, we also have Roger Nye, who's uh, in the Philharmonic, second bassoon. And so uh, the decisions are made by committee in those two instances. At the at Stony Brook and Yale, where I teach, it's more up to me, although not totally, but 
I have more to say because I'm the only bassoon teacher. Um, what I look for uh, is, for me, I, I have to hear, I mean, there has to be, you have to have a sense that a person has, you know, a, basically has an ear and a sense of rhythm. Because if, if you, if, you know, a little out of tune, everybody can play a little out of tune, you can tell if it's the read, but you have to feel that a person has that ability, has enough acuity, you might say, hearing-wise, that they're going to be able to learn to play really well in tune with the piano and with others. Because otherwise, it's not going to work out. You know, you're just not cut out for it. But I, I try to be able to tell the difference between someone not hearing it and someone having trouble because of, mechan if you want to call it mechanical issues, playing. Uh, and, of course, rhythm is rhythm. You know, it kind of, you can help somebody with their rhythm and you can learn to be more disciplined about it, but <clears throat> if someone really has an issue with, the, if you sense that they don't really feel it and hear it, like, say, playing with the piano, that, those are, people like that are wonderful, but they, they shouldn't necessarily be encouraged in such a difficult career. And then a natural sense of singing and musicality in the sound. Even if the sound is someone immature can use some changes that just it's someone is engaged with the instrument. You know, it's not just operating a piece of equipment, but is singing like already has a sense of the instrument as their voice. I, I have no trouble. In fact, there are times when I'll hear someone, I see hear a particular issue in their playing, and I think, oh, geez, I wonder if I can take that student, because I know I could fix that for them. And they need that, because otherwise it's going to hold them back, you know. And, and so I, I suffer with those kind of decisions, because... I'd like to help everybody out that I can, you know. Um, that's what I listen I listen for. Uh, I would encourage students that are coming, make sure work, in terms of also how my colleagues react, make sure you work on being well in tune. You know, today with all the great, you know, things of apps, now it's not even, even need a tuner anymore. You just need a, a phone or an Android, you know, you just need uh, some electronic device and download an app and you're ready to roll. Uh, I like the uh, Tunable, T-U-N-A-B-L-E. I don't have any interest in their company, but that's a really <laughs> great tuning. That's a really great tuning app. There are others, but that's one I like. And, of course, there are hundreds of metronome apps, you know. And uh, you really have to, you want to come in and play well in tune because that's about the least forgivable thing. Um, and you have to, Play with a sense that you love the music, you know. I would much rather, I, I like personally to take people that seem like they sing on instrument, even if they're a little bit uh, disorganized, you know, <laughs> in certain ways, but a sense of singing. Uh, and, uh, and, at, and at Juilliard in Manhattan both, I'm happy to say that we, as a, as a faculty, we really cooperate and we discuss peep at the end we discuss the days you know the the crop so to speak and we really try to come to and, and usually do a consensus we don't just leave it to numbers that academy that a admissions department going to add up like you know like some skating competition you know where the judges all <laughs> their their score because that becomes very very arbitrary in a way and so we 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 try to uh, identify the students for whom teachers have an affinity. And I mean, just like them affinity, you know, but have a sense, this is someone I'd like to work with or I think we could use in a school, you know, here if someone who would, you know, who likes this, you know, and the student. And sometimes several of us will say we would take a student and um, we're not competitive, so it doesn't matter. We say, okay, well, we'll, you know, we'll say, you know, we can indicate individually as faculty who we would like to take. And then almost uh, probably 100% of the time, because students can indicate on their application if they have a preference, uh, should the two match, that's essentially 
I think it always happens that way, or if it doesn't, I am not aware that it doesn't, um, that those that, that match will occur. If you want teacher A and teacher A likes you, that's who you'll end up with, you know. So the school's not going to reallocate you to elsewhere. So um, that, that, you know, in terms of the schools, you know, Manhattan and Juilliard, where we have multiple teachers, that's how it works. Uh, we got an email from listener Jason who wants to know what it is like playing in an orchestra without a conductor and if that took any time to get used to and if you've ever had some scary moments without someone on the podium. Yeah. Um, probably the best, after Mr. Maxim, the best thing that ever happened to me in terms of becoming educated as a musician was to become part of Orpheus because playing in a, in a an unconducted orchestra, just as in playing chamber music, which is what it is anyway, it's just very large chamber music, very large ensemble, chamber ensemble. Um, it compels you to be much more a student of the score and of the piece. You have to learn the music. You have to learn everybody's parts. You have to understand the piece from the outside more like a conductor does, like the form of the piece, even reading up on the history of the piece, perhaps listening to recordings and judging different interpretations and how you might or might not, um, uh, what you think about those. You might or might not suggest to employ those those interpretations in, in our performance. Um, also, you have to be a self-motivated artist. You can't wait for the conductor to look at you and point at you to play out, or for that matter, to put up his hand or her hand and say, shut up, you know. Um, you have to be uh, uh, really a, self, as a, a self-fired as artist. With uh, You have to, at the same time, because Orpheus, we have no principal players, you have to be able to be a solo player, you have to be able to be a leader as the first chair player, and you have to be a consummate team player as a second player playing in the section. There's no first bassoon, there's no second oboe. And so that's the way the group works. And uh, so in terms of scary moments, the scariest moment was we played the Bear Concerto for uh, violin, piano, and winds. And we only got one performance of it because none of our – we had a couple of runouts, but the runout uh, sponsors – didn't want Berg on their program because, you know, they, they wanted, you know, they'd rather hear Ina Klein and Nachmusik or whatever. <laughs> so we only had the one performance in Carnegie Hall, and usually we like to have, because that's our home base, we like to have, you know, we have a little mini tour, let's say a couple of concerts before the Carnegie concert to really work a, a piece, you know, our program up. So we had only one shot, Carnegie Hall. And it was Peter Serkin on piano and uh, one of our violinists who plays in the Orion Quartet, Todd Phillips. And we were at the dress rehearsal in Carnegie the day of the concert, and we were having trouble at first getting off the first page uh, without something going wrong. And I thought to myself, yeah, we may have met our match. <laughs> 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 that, that was the piece. But then, as always has been the case, and as often the case, for all of us in different situations. Somehow it came together, and we gave a very good performance of it. We certainly gave a good account of it for, for being one performance. You know, it's always better to play pieces more than once. But um, but that probably, that Berg was that one of those moments. And I always thought, because Peter Serkin could be quite quiet and kind of sedate and going about his job, very impersonable guy, and I had this image that outside he's saying, okay, let's try that again from rehearsal one or something, you know. And inside his head he's thinking, was I crazy? Why did I ever agree to do this? Oh, my God. You know, I, you know, like the, uh, the outside face of this, you know, very, you know, together individual, professional, going about his work, you know, preparing for the concert that night. And inside he's thinking, oh, my God, you know. <laughs> but we all, we all pulled through. So um, I would say the music making I've gotten a chance to do in Orpheus for like 38 years now 
has been absolutely one of the treasures of my life. There's just no doubt about it. As a person who has many jobs, um, how do you balance your work life and your home life? And um, how do you handle things like self-care? Yeah, that's, you know, that's a, a good question. I, you know, I doggedly tried over the years. Our son is now 27 and, of course, out of the house, and a married man. And, and uh, then my wife and I only had the one son. I've been married for 35 years. Uh, and my only, my one and only shot at it, I'm, you know, happy to say. I was lucky. I guess I got it right the first time around. Or well, let's say my wife's a saint anyway. But, uh, <laughs> that's also true. But um, I, I tried my best because I did make, I have made choices, especially when Anthony, our son was named, is named Anthony, when he was a baby and a young, you know, growing up at home. I made choices. One good thing about not having a full-time job is, and the way my life is set up is that I often could choose to do things or not do them. Like even Orpheus, we don't, it's, you know, part-time work, if you want to call it that. And, and, um, and we have it set up that you can do a set of concerts or you can take a set of concerts off. And so I avoided some of the tours, especially longer tours, European or Asian tours, when our son was younger to avoid being away from home. And even at the City Opera, where I was principal for 27 years, I would, when I was busy, like, doing the opera and Orpheus at the same time, or the American Composers Orchestra, which I played in since it was founded 40 years ago, and and such, and, you know, and again, that's only four or five concerts a year. It's not a, a full-time job. If I were busy doing a lot of teaching or playing and rehearsing outside of the opera, I would take nights off from the opera just to go home and put my son to bed. And that means I don't mean I called in sick. I mean I got docked, you know. I lost that night's pay because it was more important to be home for my son. And students knew, like even up at Yale when he was young, I would start teaching early, and when the day was done, I would hightail at home to try to get home before he went to bed because – there's nothing worse than coming home and missing the opportunity to put your kid to bed. Now, obviously, if it was after the opera at midnight, getting home, you kind of figure he's asleep. He's supposed to be. <laughs> but um, And when he was little, I think he was he, – because he didn't write this himself, so he must have been maybe in preschool or, you know, just about kindergarten. It was Father's Day, so it was the end of the school year. Maybe it was the end of his last year before kindergarten or kindergarten. And they made, like, you know, out of construction paper, you know, art paper, a tie. You know, it looked like a, a father's tie. You know, like a sort of triangle at the top where the knot would be and then, you know, a long piece that would look like the tie on the front of your shirt. Okay. And it said, and the teacher wrote, I love my daddy because, or my father. And then he had two answers. Because when he comes home from a tour, he brings me a present. And he rushes home at night so he could put me to bed. Oh. And I thought to myself, wow, he he understood that? Like, you don't think your kid knows that, you know? And I, you know, so that's, that's what I, that's how I tried to handle it. I, there were years when I worked, you know, like incredibly long hours and hard days. And fortunately, my wife, is a fantastic mother and an understanding partner. Um, and she was instrumental in make has been instrumental in making it work. And so I'm very fortunate that way with a great kid and a great mom. So, uh, in terms of self care, I've, I've remained pretty healthy over the years. Um, and, uh, I guess one thing I tried to do was go to sleep, like try not to stay up too late because <laughs> if you have to put in long days, the best thing you can do is like get some rest, you know. And uh, I love what I do. That's the other thing. 
my students will ask me, Mr. Morelli, how do you do it? You know, I don't know how you could keep up such a schedule. But I've often said, and, and uh, you know, that I said, I say it beats working for a living. For me, <laughs> you know, like, so I drive up to Yale, so that takes an hour and 20 minutes or something. So the hardest part of the day is getting the car in the lot up at Yale, you know. Once I've parked my car and I go inside and wonderful students start entering my studio, it, the work day is done. It's back to music. And Mr. Maxim said, you know, talking, going back to him, when he was dying, and I was talking to him when he was still teaching, he taught up to a week before he died. And I called him up and he says, you know what's so great about teaching? You know, you're getting together with the students and you're in the pursuit of truth, you know, in the pursuit of beauty. That's what we do. The truth in yourself, the truth in the music. Mm. And uh, it's I, I, I look forward to it every day. So uh, I love what I do. And uh, I know I noticed online, actually, someone asked a question about how do I teach, you know, do I, how do I devote myself to all my students? Well, I think I sort of just answered it a little bit. But the fact is, I get as much satisfaction out of teaching as satisfaction out of teaching as I do from performing, and I love to perform. I love playing the bassoon. After all these years, fifty years on the bassoon, at least, I love it. I love playing the bassoon, and I love being in the middle of this fantastic music, and I love working with my students. It's joyful. You know, uh, I whether it's hard work, you know, me, I mean, a hard, not hard work, that's the wrong word. When it's a problem that you have to fix, you know, it's not just working out the interpretation of something. I find that just as enjoyable as, you know, working on beautiful music and the enjoyment that we get out of just being in that world. And when students say to me, Oh, I have to. I have to. Sorry to make you hear this, but I'm gonna. I'd like to play the exposition of the Mozart Concerto. I say, don't apologize. I love, you know, I love the piece. I'm not thinking, oh, that Mozart Concerto exposition again. I could think to choose that. I guess one could choose to think that way, but I don't. It's another opportunity to think about it and hear it. And to hear someone else's interpretation and to to explore what the possibilities are. That's the way I look at it. I still look at it that way. So um, I'm a happy guy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I do it. <laughs> so one question I love to ask all of our guests is for you to tell us about a favorite, or if you can't pick one, um, people can't always pick one, but a favorite memory of a past performance of yours. Oh, wow. Oh, geez. <laughs> that's, that's a hard one to answer. That's what I've everyone honest, says. <laughs> I've, I've, I've been so fortunate to be part of so many incredible performances that all over the world that I it's hard it's hard for me to answer that question and by the same token some of the most enjoyable times I've had were uh, our son plays saxophone my wife plays piano she was also bassoonist and we would make up our own like little arrange little things with playing in our living room with my wife and my son, that might be the most memorable thing I've ever done. Hmm. And, you know, I've had the opportunity to play just with great solo artists, with my dear colleagues like in Windscape, where, I, you know, Quintet I playing with Tara O'Connor and Randall Ellis and Alan Kay and David Jolly. You know, these are some of my dearest friends for decades and um, so Windscape is something, as I've mentioned, some Orpheus stuff. I've, it's, it's, uh, it's really hard for me to, to pin it down. I, I, I've been in too many wonderful, memorable performances without name-dropping. 
then it gets away. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? Then it gets away. Yes. Well, I played here, I played there, and, you know, that I don't know. I would say the Morelli Trio. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. What would you say to a young musician who aspires to have a career like yours? Wow. Well, it's harder now, I think, than it was before. Uh, but it's changing. You guys, I mean, even the fact that we're doing this, and this is going to be on the, the Internet, you know, uh, which did not exist when I was the age of the people you're asking me to give advice to. The, the world is changing. Music is changing. I think the thing to realize is um, be adaptable, be versatile. Um, like I said, the way I've, I've found my way forward by trying to improve myself and seek opportunity and um, always do my best. I know that sounds so kind of, you know, like, you know, like from Rocky or something. You know, <laughs> you know. but, but the fact is you never know who's listening to you. You never know how one thing leads to another. As I pointed out, I think one message of my, you know, talking to you is it's totally unpredictable that what might happen. The only thing you have control over is bettering yourself, right? The same way on an audition, the only thing you have control over is how you play. That's hard to remember when you're in there and you're nervous and all that and uncomfortable. At least I know I was always nervous in auditions. So, you know, that's not uncommon to me. But I, but if I could be calm and step outside it, I, I would know the only thing I can control in this situation is to play well. And you have to be a good colleague. You're not in competition with anybody. What you are is in competition with your own ability to realize your potential. And uh, I think... You know, this whole entrepreneurial thing, which is such a big deal now, and schools teach these courses in it. But the point is, yes, make opportunity for yourself when you can. And I guess that that's my, my best advice. Awesome. This has been amazing. We can't thank you enough for being so generous with your time. It has been, on a personal note, so awesome to hear from you, and I can't wait to share this interview with our listeners so where can our listeners find you on the Internet, and is there anything else exciting on the horizon for you? Well, on the Internet, I have a website. That's morellibassoon.com, M-O-R-E-L-L-I, bassoon.com. And uh, there's some stuff on there, uh, including, I mean, you could buy some CDs there, but, I mean, there's biography stuff, but also some what I, uh, uh, master class stuff about you know, pedagogy, so people are welcome to go there, and I think it's downloadable and all, but information there, if if, if it interests you. Uh, other than that, a really exciting uh, project I've been involved with for over a year now is I was contacted by Carl Fisher because they felt it was time for them to update the Bethany Weisenborn method. That's the one that includes the Weisenborn method, the Weisenborn 50 Etudes and the Mildy Studies and some other stuff slapped together. Um, and I've created the what I believe the title will be, because it is, the first complete Weisenborn method and studies. And the reason I call it that is you have the Weisenborn method that many of us are familiar with, and you may have a copy of it with just the method, or many of us have a copy with the method and the 50 etudes of Weisenborn. The 50 etudes was a volume called Opus 8 Number 2 for advanced players. Those are the 50 etudes. But there was also, many people know about it, but I never did, really. I never worked out of it. A thing called Opus 8 Number 1, number one for beginners. And that included a lot of uh, all uh, more simple, some simple exercises, as well as uh, some intermediate, what essentially are intermediate etudes, you might say, and then other chapters on tenor clef, ornamentation, things, some of which are found in the method. And what I've done is I've folded in Opus 8, number one, this other book of Weissenborn's, with the, and the 50 etudes, along with the method and the mildy. 
that were included in Bettany's version of it. Uh, the other thing, those of you who know are familiar and teachers out there would know, is that those books were never integrated. In fact, Open State number one and two, including like the 50 etudes most people know, as you know, they do not go along with the um, the the twenty something lessons in the original method book, which only goes up to high B flat, even though the 50 etudes go up to high E. So what I did is I added chapters at the end, method lessons at the end of the method, introducing notes up to high E. I've integrated the tenor clef into the actual lessons, beginning with the lesson that introduces the note G above middle C. Uh, in the first, in the, uh, those of you that know the Weizenborn method, he, at the end of it, had a page on tenor clef was sort of like, oh, by the way, you should learn tenor clef. Good luck with that. And then the book was done. <laughs> right? Right? That's, right? That's how it's done. Uh, yeah. So what I've done is I've reworked it, using all Weizenborn stuff. It's his book still. Uh, in the same order that he taught making, you know, the notes uh, that he taught. But I've added chapters at the end. Then I did another thing. One of the things that uh, most people talk about when they think of the Weizenborn is the duets, right? People like to play the duets when you play them with your teacher, let's say. But those were all duets written by Weizenborn. They're very nice, but none of them are familiar. So what I did is I've arranged 36 bonus duets, I call them. And starting with chapter two, or lesson two, I should say, each chapter has at least, each lesson has at least one of these bonus duos. And they come from their familiar tunes. You know, some, the early ones, of course, before they know too many notes, there's not much you can do. But, uh, you know, it's about like Mary Had a Little Lamb or something like that, and Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. But even Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, I used the uh, Mozart version, his piano from his, uh, like a takeoff on the piano variations. And then beautiful tunes like the, you know, the English ones coming home from the New World Symphony. Mm -hmm. The beautiful slow movement of the pathetic sonata of Beethoven. Um, spring from, bum, 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 ba, da, da, from the Vivaldi Four Seasons. And things that students and even their parents would recognize. And then as the book goes on, I integrate bassoon solos. Uh, like Tchaikovsky 4, 5, and 6, and Scheherazade, and, and, and as you get way to the end, Bolero and the Rite of Spring and such. So by the end of the book, you have been through almost, the student will have gone through almost every major excerpt or thereabouts in a duet form with the teacher. Now, sometimes the duets, they're not really duets, like a formed piece of music, you know, but, but written out for two instruments. And um, and then the other thing I've added to the book, because today we have so little music education, I added a fun fact to each chapter. And, like, the fun fact might be, because I have the Ode to Joy, you know, is one of them. So the fun fact is that when Beethoven wrote that, he was deaf. And as the piece finished in its premiere performance, he didn't realize it was over because he didn't know. And someone had to come over. One of the singers came over and turned him to the audience to make him realize that they were all wildly cheering the piece. And, you know, it's important that we encourage students to learn. You know, like that, the, like to give, they're not like talk down facts, like, like timelines and information. You know, uh, I've tried to make them each little fun fact to be a chance for an inquisitive student to want to learn more and perhaps for a dialogue to start off because of it between the teacher and the student. Um, in other words, I tried to make the book a little less dry, a little less 19, 18, 1880s German. <laughs> you know, for instance, in his original full introduction, he says, by the time the young man, they're younger, you know, because women, why would you teach girls music? You know, they're teach learning, you know, like, <laughs> it's a different time, obviously, right? <laughs> so, you know, the young man will have been, have already learned to play the violin or the piano, and now the bassoon is assumed to be like a second instrument. That's why the Weizenborn doesn't teach Music reading, you know what I mean? It's not a primer in that way. It's assumed you know something about music. So 
In other words, it was a different time, and it was assumed you would have been playing piano in your home or the violin or something. So we need, we want to, I want to share my joy, my love of this through this book and to give students some encouragement and some enticement to want to be part of the world of music. And, and then the last thing, and then I'll shut up on this. I wrote actually two chapters of pedagogy coming from Mr. Maxim's teaching, one like basic, and then at the end of the book, more advanced stuff. And, but wait, there's more. <laughs> one more thing. The, the other thing like I said about the book was not integrated. I have created a study key, which I stole the idea from the old Rubank method, advanced method, so that for each chat, each lesson in the book, you'll look at it like a table of contents or something or a key, and you will be able to see what else in the book is available to you outside of the lessons. In other words, in the supplemental materials, his original Anhang or, you know, his supplement that was in the original method, and then the Opus 8 numbers 1 and 2 books of Weissenborn and the Mildy, which, of course, come up way at the end because they, so many of them have high notes. You know, I mean, you can't really start them until you know a lot of the bassoon to play Mildy studies. So a teacher or a student will be able to look at any given lesson and see all the material available to him or her in the book. So that's what I did. <laughs> that sounds awesome. I can't wait. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm so excited to share this interview with our listeners. Oh, it was my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for asking me. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed that interview as much as we did. That was a good one. I loved that. Um, don't forget to check us out on social media. We are at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Double Read Dish. And you can contact us via our website, DoubleReadDish.com, um, or at DoubleReadDish at gmail.com. And I'm so excited to announce our oboe guest for Episode 16 is the principal oboist of the L.A. Chamber Orchestra, Claire Brazell.